Though it was so many bits and pieces divided between kings, what is it that made us feel like one nation? What is it that people from outside saw that they called us as one nation? People believe that this word or this name, Bharat, came because this land was ruled by King Bharata. But the case is, he got the name from the nation, not the other way round. As even today, there are thousands of people named, there are thousands of Bharatis and Bharat Kumars in the country. Similarly, he was one more Bharata of the day. A great emperor, greatness not just because of his conquests, at his full flow, before he got old, he decided to coronate the next king. He had nine sons, but he saw a young boy who was only twenty-two years of age, whose name was Bhumanyu, who was the son of sage Bharatwaj. This boy grew up in the forest, never been exposed to the world outside. First time when he came, King Bharata's eyes fell upon him and he said, this boy should be the king of this empire, not any of my sons. The first <coughs> act of democracy six thousand years ago. <laughs> but of course later on, we've… since then we've been having Dhritarashtra syndrome, that's a different thing. At any cost, blood versus brain. <clears throat> so this land, Bharat, why it is significant? Why is it that it is important to… why is it that people, beyond the cost of their life, they try to protect this? What is the significance of this? The word Bharata comes from three aspects. Bha means bhava, ra means raga, tha means thala. Bhava means, essentially means sensation or we can translate it as experience because all our experience of life right now is through the sensory perception. So every experience of life is actually a sensation. Well, it may not be sensational for a lot of people, but it is a sensation. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste is all a certain type of sensation. Sensations of pleasantness, sensations of unpleasantness determine the nature and the quality of one's life. If you have pleasant sensations, you may call this peace, happiness, joy, bliss, ecstasy. If you… if your sensations are unpleasant, you may call this stress, tension, ang anxiety, misery, agony, whatever we want to call it, many names. But essentially, this is a contest within ourselves of pleasantness and unpleasantness. In the yogic culture, if the body becomes pleasant, we call this health. 
If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. If your mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call this joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call this love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If your very life energies become pleasant, we call this blissfulness. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If our surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. Of course, they call it go. <laughs> so, humanity is continuously in pursuit of this pleasantness. The man who goes to the bar and the man who goes to the temple, their fundamental pursuit is same. The question is who is successful? The question is how enduring is it? But essentially, every human being is only seeing how to make their experience of life pleasant. Somebody thinks money will do it, somebody thinks education will do it, somebody thinks love will do it. Different people have different ideas, some people believe it will happen only in heaven. <coughs> but essentially everybody is in pursuit of this. Now, so the bha ref refers to the sensation or the experience, how to take charge of this because Human experience is completely an internalized process in the sense, this moment you think I'm standing here, but the reality of the experience is light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the whole story. So you see me within you, you hear me within you, you have seen everything that you've ever seen only within you, you have ever ev experienced everything that you ever experienced only within you. You know the existence only the way it is happening within you. You're incapable of knowing anything else actually. Right now if somebody next to you touches your hand, you think you're experiencing their hand, but the fact is you're only experiencing the sensations in your hand. You cannot experience the other hand. You can experience this sensation with the support of this ha other hand or even without the support of this other hand, this is something that is well established right now. Just with imagination, you can make sensations happen in your system. So, bha or bhava is an important part because this is entirely in your hands. You can create super pleasant sensations or super unpleasant sensations. This is entirely your doing. Ra means raga, this you have nothing to do with because this is the nature of the existence. This is a changeless reality which is the fundamental of who we are and everything is. This is the fundamental law of creation. This is the raga, the tune of life. This we cannot do anything about it, but we can know it only through ourselves. This is what in the yogic culture is called svadharma, the loss of the self, that what is the nature of your inner existence? Only by exploring this, you know the raga. If you know the raga, then you set the thala or the rhythm. If you get the rhythm right, you write this life as a wonderful experience. If you don't get the rhythm right, you will be crushed by the same life. All of us are living in the same world, some people's experience of life is absolutely fantastic. Some people's experience of life, they feel crushed by the simple process of life. This is just a question of, have you gotten the rhythm right or not? To get the ra thala right, you must be able to listen to the raga. If you don't hear the inner raga, then thala will be all set by the society. It works sometimes, it doesn't work sometimes. This is what you are seeing today. As a generation of people, we know more comforts and convenience than any generation ever on this planet. We are the most comfortable generation ever in the history of humanity. Do you agree with me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Never before another generation of people have ever known these type of comforts and conveniences as all of us are enjoying. What royalty could not have, today ordinary citizens have. 
most of you are driving hundred, two hundred horses worth of chariots, isn't it? But are we any more joyful? Because this will not change our experience of life. If we fix the external, it will only change the outside realities, it will bring comfort and convenience, it will ne never change the inner experience. So, the bhava and the thala which is in our hands and the raga with which we have nothing to do but without knowing the raga, you can't set the thala properly. Only if you know the raga, you can set the thala, otherwise your thala is accidentally sometimes working, sometimes not working. If you look at the human experience on this planet, the more affluent the societies get, you will see the longer the faces are getting unfortunately at a great expense. At a tremendous expense to every other creature on the planet, people are miserable. At least if you're ecstatic, you have maybe a right to burn the planet. Miserable people have no right to burn the planet, isn't it? <laughs> if you think it's a party and you're burning up the planet, that is one thing. But miserable people are burning up the planet, they think by burning more they'll get better. It's not happening because it'll never happen that way. So this nation was formed on this fundamental aspect. This culture was cultured scientifically to see that one takes charge of one's bhava and listens to the raga and sets the right thala so that life happens in its fullest possible way for the individual human being. <coughs> if you look at the people that this land worships, first of all we must understand these were not people that we saw them descending from heaven, these were people who walked the geography of this land. Whether you take Rama, Krishna, Shiva, whoever, they are all people who walked this land. Normal births went through the entire process of life, trials and tribulations. And if you look at their life, whatever, whatever they took up as a big mission in their life, none of them really succeeded in what they were doing. You take Rama for example, he's one of the biggest deities in the country. If you take Shiva, his wife emulates herself and you know, he becomes so miserable at one point and then he comes out of it, whatever. Then Rama, his wife gets kidnapped, terrible battle. Then he comes back, recovers the wife. For political reasons he has to give her up. Then unknowingly he fights a battle with his own children. You can't call this a successful life. But, but the reason, but the reason why we worship them, you look at Krishna, his entire life's mission was to marry the political and the spiritual process in the country. He thought he will bring enduring prosperity and well-being and peace on this land. Instead of that, it ended up in a disastrous war and his own clan fought themselves to death. But still we worship them because we never value what happens in terms of what we do in the world because what happens in the world depends on various circumstances. Who you are is not determined by what you could do and could not do. Who you are is determined by how you conducted your life. With all this terrible drama happening in their lives, they stayed above that. They remained free of that. This is the quality that we are worshipping because the highest value in this nation has always been freedom or liberation because the ultimate goal of all people born in this land is supposed to be mukti, not heaven, not God. God is just one more tool, one more stepping stone. The only reason you are supposed to live here, it doesn't matter, you get married, you have children, you do business, you do politics, all these things you do only as another means for your mukti. This is how the culture is, has evolved. So, Though we are different kinds of people, we speak differently, we look different, we eat different, everything is different about us, still we have been one nation because we have been a land of seekers and that's been unique. Everywhere else, nations are formed on the sameness of race, religion, language, ethnicity and these kind of things. If you drive fifty kilometers in this country, 
people look different, they dress different, they eat different, they speak different, everything is different about them. Anybody who comes from outside the country cannot imagine what is this nation, it's a kaleidoscope of people. There is nothing common about anybody. Tell me what's common about the Tamil people and the Gujarati people. We don't like your food, <laughs> but we have no problems with you <laughs> So everything is different. In the same family, in the same room, five people will be worshipping five different gods and there's no issue. There isn't another land like this. If… if you want a classic example of inclusiveness, this is it, because <laughs> Tell me in which place on the planet, people can sit in the same room at the same time and worship five different gods. It's not possible, because in the very nature of belief system is, what I believe is right, what you may believe must be wrong. But because we are a land of seekers, there's never been a concretized belief system. There has never been a concretized idea of God. In many ways, this is the only godless country on the planet because we understood the technologies of God-making. How this… <laughs> now, I want you to understand, this is an entire science and technology by itself. What you are referring to, because the word God is an imported word, we only call them murtis or deities or we call them yantras. The word yantra literally translates as a machine or in other words, we called our gods as machines. Even today, we have a Dhyanalinga temple in the yoga center. When I'm speaking, if I refer to the Dhyanalinga as a tool, some people will feel offended. Sadhguru, don't call Dhyanalinga a tool, it's more than our life. I say, it's okay, if it's more than your life, you do one thing. You come to the yoga center, I'll give you a plumbing job. No spanner, no, win no winch, no any tools. Use your hands, fingers, teeth, whatever you want. In three days' time, and half of them are gone, you come to me, I'll give you a spanner. Will you worship the spanner or not? <laughs> you sure will. Because human beings are who they are on this planet only because of our ability to use the tools. Otherwise, I'm telling you, a colony of ants would supersede the human uh, race. Dogs can rule over the human beings. Today, we are trying to protect the tigers. <laughs> a tiger needs protection. We always thought tiger means <laughs> it is the ultimate <laughs> everything. But a tiger needs protection, an elephant needs protection only because human beings are able to use tools, isn't it? So as there are physical tools, there are subjective tools. Many variety of tools we created in this land. How to use this tool for specific purposes was clearly described. Unfortunately, in this many, many years of occupation and being ruled by others, these things have gotten little distorted and dislocated. Otherwise, this is an entire science by itself. This can be accessed to make life into a phenomenal process. All tools that we create is only an extension of faculties that we already have. Because we can speak, we have a microphone. You were talking about telephones. <laughs> because we can speak, there is a telephone. Because we can see, there is a microscope, there is a telescope. Everything that we can do, there is an extension of that. This is what all the instruments and machines are. Because we are mobile, we came up with a bicycle. If we were made like trees, we wouldn't bother about a bicycle for sure. So everything that we have created as machines are only extension of our faculties. Similarly, as we can see, not only through our eyes, we can see, see through our mind's eye, how far you can see can be enhanced by certain tools. What we can do subjectively can be greatly enhanced by certain tools. So this is how we created the deities or yantras, but unfortunately, somewhere along the way, this science kind of became little diluted, though it is still very much alive in the country. Largely, it has become little out of shape. 
Many examples are there, but uh, unless those examples have found credence in the Western culture, it is not really credible. So, <laughs> we will take uh, Ramanujam as an example. You know Ramanujam was a great mathematician from Tamil Nadu. Not much educational background behind him, but he poured out mathematics. A little over a century, the formulas that he wrote, books and books of formulas that he simply poured out. Today they are saying these formulas describe, mathematically describe the black holes. You must understand in 1910 or 1908 when he wrote this, there was no concept of black hole in the scientific community. It's a much, much later happening. But he made mathematical backbone for the black holes about which there was no concept. There was no such idea anywhere in the world, but he created the mathematical background. When they asked him how, he said, my Devi, my Goddess gives me all this. Even sitting on his deathbed, he poured up, poured out. I think still only about sixty, seventy percent of his mathematics has been kind of understood. The rest is yet to be understood. They know there is something to it, but nobody is there to decipher exactly what he has written. So, people can find excess, open up windows to the universe. This is what the deities were. Never in India, the temples were a place of worship. It is only a recent happening. I think in northern India, it's mostly lost. In south, even today, if you go to the temple, people will tell you, there is no need to worship, there is no need to give an application or an appeal to God, but you must sit there for some time because these were created like powerful energy spaces. This is all about enhancing the human being. This is not about heaven, this is not about God, this is about letting the human being overflow with his fullest potential because the nature of the universe, the nature of life here is such, for every other creature, nature has drawn two lines within which they have to live and go. For the human being, there is only a bottom line, there is no top line. If you want to explore limitlessly, all shackles have to be removed. Freedom is the only ultimate value. This is why mukti was the only value. Not God, not heaven, not this, not that. Mukti or liberation was the highest value always. How you get there is up to you. If you want to use forms, you can do it. Without forms, you can do it. You don't believe in anything, that's also fine. It doesn't matter how. You must see there are yogis who wake up in the morning and who will take God's name with great devotion. There are yogis who will wake up in the morning and abuse every god on the planet <laughs> and still they are also on the spiritual path. Why I am saying this is because no particular way was described. All that we knew is if you… whichever dimension of who you are, if you pursue it unwavering with tremendous intensity, you will break through from the limitations in which you are. This is why a million forms of spiritual process happen. Unfortunately, today, these generations are… very few people are even aware that such things exist. When Mark Twain visited India, and he was here for little over three months, he had a good guide who took him to the right places. When he was leaving, he said, Anything that can ever be done, either by man or God, has been done in this land. Because in terms of exploring human mechanism, in terms of understanding the inner mechanics of how a human being is made and what are the possibilities within the human being, no one else anywhere has ever explored with the profoundness and the variety in which it has been done. This is the future of the world in many ways because as human intellect sparks, today, as a generation of people, we are in a place where more people can think for themselves than ever before. Never before in the history of humanity, so many people could think for themselves. Whether they're thinking straight or not is another thing, but they're beginning to think. When people's intellect sparks, then solutions in heaven won't work. Solutions have to be scientific, have to fit into the logical framework of who we are, otherwise it will not work. So, this dimension 
of a completely a religious spiritual dimension which made this land into a land of seekers never land of believers because what we believe is a cultured product in the sense depending upon which society we are born in accordingly we believe something because that belief was overwhelmingly there influencing us on all levels so what we believe is purely a cultural thing but the fact of the matter is today even modern scientists all the top scientists in the world are attempting are openly admitting that it is not only that we do not know this is unknowable what they are saying is unknowable is not the nature of the existence they are talking about just the physical existence they are saying the physical existence after enormous research or dissection even into the particles of the atom it is unknowable physical dimension is less than 2% even in a single atom in the universe it's less than 1% so this 1% we are admitting that it is unknowable not the remaining 99% that we have not even touched so this culture explored that dimension knowing that a human being can know whatever he wishes to know only from within because everything you know the way it happens within you you have no capability to know anything outside of you right now you can see what's around you with your eyes you can't roll your eyeballs and scan yourself <clears throat> you can hear this so much activity in the body you cannot hear this if an ant crawls upon this hand you can feel it so much blood flowing you cannot feel it because in the very nature of